All right, it sure has been good going through Revelation series and, and both here in Iola. And, and uh, the studying is great, the, the thoughts and just thinking through it all. Sometimes it's hard to get out, number one. I wonder after I'm done sometimes, like, did anybody get anything that I said? And then other times uh, I think, yeah, there, I keep revealing to myself how little I actually know about this stuff. Like so much of that's, that is still a mystery to me. And this is why you can go to the books, Christian bookstore. I don't recommend it, but pick up about 10 books on Revelation. Probably all 10 of them are going to say a little different thing. Like, no, this is what this represents and this is what this is. So a lot of it's a mystery, okay? We understand that. But some of the key elements are revealed to us, all right? So obviously there's a lot of unknown when it comes to prophecy in general. But here's the good news. We've reached a part in the story where we know that we're all gone <laughs> and we're safe from that. Everything that's going on now with God pouring out his wrath on the earth does not involve the believers because we, uh, we are safe from that. Now, there are 144,000. We talked about that, I guess, a couple weeks ago. And uh, they are sealed in their forehead. And this protects them from, uh, from the... the, the uh, Judgments that are being poured out. Now, here's an interesting thing. Somebody on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, on the video where I talked about the, uh, the the sealing before the unsealing. So we talked about the 144,000, and a friend of mine wrote on there, uh, not argumentative. He just we just like talking about different things, and he said he doesn't believe. Of course, you know he doesn't believe in my uh, interpretation of the end times and the timeline and all that stuff. And he said an interesting thought that challenged me. And he said, well, if the 144,000 are immortals, if they're saints in their glorified bodies that have been resurrected, what's the point of them being sealed? Aren't they already, you know, aren't they already spared from that in, in, in their glorified bodies? <clears throat> My answer to that is, I don't really know. Like, I don't completely understand the sealing, what our human bodies are like. The two witnesses, most people call most people call them by name and say, well, it's Moses and Elijah, right? Yet they die. They, they physically die on the earth. So I don't know what kind of bodies they're given or, or what can happen uh, with these judgments that are being poured out. All I know is that they're sealed before these things happen. And really, if you keep reading, you find out that actually every child of God is going to have the name of the Lord in their forehead, right? So at some point, it's like, uh, this is kind of my thinking is that, we're all sealed, you know. <laughs> we're, of course, we're sealed with the Holy Ghost, but then there's some kind of a special sealing in our glorified bodies, uh, you know, but we're just not going to be on the earth. And so that actually, to me, kind of makes sense if they got sealed, you know, and then they're coming to stay on earth, whereas we miss out on this stuff that's going on. They get front row seat tickets, okay? They get to watch the end of the earth firsthand and probably are even responsible for dishing a little bit of it out, I'm thinking, okay? But anyway, the 144,000 is an interesting uh, topic. But here uh, we know that the all the believers, except for those 144,000, are removed. <clears throat> I already saw, as we talked about last week, bapt, uh, uh, baptized by fire or the fire baptism. And we talked about how the first four out of seven judgments that are poured, the trump, I'm talking about the trumpet judgments. We'll talk later, Lord willing, about the, the, uh, vile, or the, uh, the vile judgments. And I believe that they kind of line up and we'll see that. But the first four out of seven trumpet judgments dealt a lot with fire fire coming down. Of course, there's prophecy all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament prophets, and then uh, Jesus talking about it. And in fact, this morning in Iola, I talked about how he said, I bring division, and they said, I bring fire. And I think in the context, he's talking about, look, you know, he is going to be the final judge. He's going to be the one who pours out this, uh, this wrath on the earth. And so literally, uh, we see fire burning up a third of the earth and, and all and, and, and stars coming and all. Pretty interesting. But now we're getting to the next uh, of the seven, seven uh, trumpet judgments. So we've got five, six, and seven. And to, uh, to, to start these, he calls them woes. All right, he says there's going to be three woes. And we're going to talk about those 
uh, tonight, this afternoon. And the title of the message is Seeking Death and Not Finding It. Seeking Death and Not Finding It. That's the thing that really jumped out to me as he talked about this, uh, uh, this, this third seal. Let's look at that. Okay, verse 1 through 11. <clears throat> Revelation 9, verse 1 through 11 is the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. A lot of speculation. What is that star? I've heard some people say it's an angel. Okay, other places in the Bible where a star seems to represent an angel. Uh, some people, I suspect, will say, remember the vision of Jesus and he has the 12 angels, 12 stars in his hand, and these are the 12 angels of the churches. That pro might be why some people say, no, I believe those are literal, church, uh, literal angels that he's talking to in the seven churches of Asia. To me, that doesn't make sense because the, the, the things that he's telling the churches, it doesn't, it doesn't understand. I mean, he's talking to the angel of the church. And the things that he says, it doesn't make sense to me that he'd be talking to an angel. What would be the point? Okay, and that's why I took the interpretation that, it, that it's, it's probably the pastors of those churches. There's a lot of disagreements on those. But anyway, <clears throat> but who knows what these, this star is, okay? But this star comes out, and it makes sense that it would be an angel of some sort because it says that he opened... Uh, or he had the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as a smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Pit. We might think, you know, well, maybe it's not really, maybe it's just down deep in the earth into some pit. The Bible uses the word pit a lot just for a big hole or something. We might think, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean hell. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, uh, I've heard theories out there that said, no, I don't know that hell is necessarily in the center of the earth, but maybe it's just out there somewhere. And I think the Bible makes it really, really clear that hell's in the center of the earth. And right here, he doesn't just say pit. What does he say? He says he had the keys to the bottomless pit. Why would he need a key there? except for he has the key to hell, okay? That's a phrase that we're used to. So he has the key to the bottomless pit, and he opens this pit, and these locusts come out of the ground, all right? Now, these aren't just your ordinary locusts, of course. <laughs> An ordinary locust is what? Kind of like a grasshopper, you know? A plague of grasshoppers would be, uh, or a plague of locusts would be a pretty bad plague, and a lot of people have experienced plagues where they're, grasshoppers come or locusts come and they, they eat all the crops and stuff like that, that'd be pretty bad. You know, you think about Moses, uh, you know, the, and the plagues on Egypt and they, they had different plagues with flies and frogs and all. That's pretty terrible uh, plagues. But this is different. L listen to how it describes these locusts that come up. And it says also, unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Anybody ever bit bit by a scorpion, by the way? I, I've never been bit by a scorpion. I've seen some here in Kansas. They have them in Kansas. I've never been bit by one. <laughs> and I, if I understand right, if one bites you, it's not necessarily that bad of a thing. I mean, it probably stings. I don't know because I've never had it, but I've been bitten by a bee. You ever had a bee sting and your hand swells up? And, or stung by a bee, I guess, sorry. Have you ever been stung by a, uh, a, uh, uh, what, <laughs> I got distracted. Okay, so anyway, these are locusts, and they have this uh, interesting uh, appearance. Okay, let's keep reading. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, uh, neither any tree, but only those men, I mean, uh, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And I'm, I suspect a very severe, okay, sting. A very severe because uh, these are no doubt some giant uh, scorpion-looking locust-like creatures. Okay, when he striketh a man. Verse 6, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now, we know later on, a lot of people are going to die still, so that's not like nobody's ever going to die from this point on. They're just going to endure uh, suffering. But kind of getting ahead of myself, it's obvious 
you know, we all understand this, that hell is an, is an eternal torment, okay? Eternal torment where people are going to wish to die and they can't die. And so on earth, they actually experience this for a short amount of time where they, they, they seek death and they can't find it. Now listen to the shape of the, uh, the locust, verse 7. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth uh, uh, were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Now, again, if you get a whole bunch of books on, on the book of Revelation, and you read what they say about these beasts, they're going to say all kinds of things. All right, I've heard people say, you know, look at world. It probably had to go back to World War II times, and they said, hey, look at these planes, and these planes had these engines on them, right? And those engines made the sound. Oh, and also horsepower, right? That's what, <laughs> and the engines had this sound uh, uh, like uh, many running horses to battle. And it talks about the tail like a scorpion. You can see where that might be a plane. And, oh, do you remember those World War II planes? They had uh, painted teeth on the, on the front of it. And so people say, look, there's teeth. And, and uh, people have tried to speculate what these are. Certain, uh, certain things in the Bible says, oh, no, those were tanks coming. Or those were, you know, the scorpion uh, thing is talking about they're, they're, they're shooting. But they say John didn't know what those things looked like, which I agree with that. Like he could see a vision of things that happened, you know, in the next you know, century, and he wouldn't have a clue what he was looking at. Okay, and so I agree with that, but I read this, and to me, this seems like these creatures that really exist that are living in hell, and they come up at this time. Now, it makes sense to me because we see creatures in heaven. We see creatures that are called beasts in heaven, right? Cherub, cherubim, and they've got these faces like animals, uh, that are described and all that stuff. So it makes sense to me that there would be these real creatures that live in hell. Now, obviously, I would say they're supernatural, right? Uh, I don't think there's any, there are any animals that could endure fire, let alone go down to the heart of the earth <laughs> and endure the uh, bottomless pit. But I did see somebody said this. Uh, somebody was looking up... Uh, I mean, I looked up this and somebody gave an answer as to, are there any animals that can resist fire? And apparently there are some insects and even some worms that can live at a pretty high temperature, which is why some have said when the Bible talks about the worm dieth not, they say that was because if you looked into a fire, you could see some worms that still lived after the fire. And so that's what they're talking about. I don't think so. I think they're talking about, you know, <laughs> something different that actually uh, does not die in hell. Uh, but, but that's another story. Okay, well, what exactly that is, I don't know. But here's what this person said. While a few animals are heat tolerant, some worms, some insects, up to uh, 49 degrees Celsius or 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So after 120 degrees, most of those insects or whatever would start dying. Okay, which is good to know. If you ever got an infestation of something, you know, just crank it up to 120 and they're all going to die. <laughs> okay. No animal can withstand fire. A wood fire releases gases which burn and increase the temperature of the wood to about 600 degrees Celsius or 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. If this is true, what this man is saying, that's an extreme heat. And that's just fire. That's just fire that exists. You know, like if you start a fire, it could get to that kind of temperature, let alone what the, the amount of heat that's down uh, in the earth. You know, they've tried to drill down into the center of the earth and they can't even sc hardly scratch the surface uh, because it's not very far down before it's just so hot the temperature will just melt any drill that, uh, that exists. <clears throat> so you have to wonder, like, are these real creatures and are they there presently? Like, do they just exist there? Have they always been there? Do they, are, are they like just angels that have, you know, have been there as long as other angels have been around and angels been in heaven and Maybe that's what they're, what they're there for. And, and, uh, the, and here's the thing. We understand that their job is to torment, right? Now, now, the creatures in heaven, what's their job? Praising the Lord, 
They're praising the Lord. They don't, and they're ministers. Angels are ministers. All right? These angels are ministers too, <laughs> but they're ministering torment. Okay? And uh, I don't know that they're angels, but I'm just saying these creatures minister uh, torment. Now, the Bible says a lot about torment in relationship to hell, right? Look at Luke 16. We're familiar with this verse. Luke chapter 16, from verse 22. This is the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Interestingly, the B is lowercase because it's literally Abraham's bosom, I, I think. I don't think it's a place. Okay, The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now it's interesting to me, like, like ancient writings and then a lot of uh, uh, people, even commentators today, will talk about this story. I don't want to get too far off into this, but and they'll say, look, uh, look, there's compartments in hell. And you had the good compartment, which was Abraham's bosom, and you had the bad compartment, which was, you know, where people were tormented. And I always thought, like, so I guess they just got a bubble around them, like this just protects them from that heat or something. I don't know what's that all about, right? And then it says, well, it has to be that way because, look, they're talking to each other. And there's a great goal fixed between them, but they're talking to each other. And I've always thought, like, if you're in fire... I don't care how big the gulf is. Like, you can't see across. You you know, oh, is that Abraham over there? Oh, is that Lazarus? And then, <laughs> you know, you can't see that. So there was some kind of vision that he was able to have. Maybe God gave him the vision, or, or maybe we just see things differently, uh, you know, in, in, that, in that state or something like that. I don't know, but this conversation that took place, it wasn't like, hey, Abraham! <laughs> Send over some water. No, it was, it's not like that, okay? He was seeing uh, in a different in a different light. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, they had. <laughs> but anyway, I got off on that. Verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so, you see, uh, he talks about torment a couple of different times in this, in this chapter. He says, I don't want my brothers to come to this uh, torment. And so uh, we understand that there's torment in hell, but it seems like torment is always in association with the flames. Of course, we understand there's an eternal flame. Uh, fire that's burning there. Look at Revelation 20, another popular passage of Scripture here. Revelation 20. And verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever and so uh so there are tormentors there are tormentors now uh some people have come up with these different ideas about these tormentors as if they are just some kind of like you know like i don't know maybe in hell they just kind of formed ranks and decided hey this will be your job that will be your job look i can't get around this and this is actually the subject of my message tonight in Can in iola but I can't get, behind, get, get around this idea, although it's hard for some people to fathom. But the torment that's being uh, ministered here is directly from the hand of God. Okay? And he's using these creatures to do the tormenting. The flame is directly something that he created, the, the hell, hell fire. All, right? all, these, all these things, and, and, and tonight I'm going to talk about uh, this and, and show how how so many times God pours out something, and you can't tell, is it God doing it, or is it Satan doing it? And the answer is yes. <laughs> God is allowing Satan to do certain things, okay? An example of that would be David. All right, David, uh, when he numbers Israel, you look in Samuel, and it says that God 
you know, uh, moved him to number. I can't remember how it says it exactly. God moved him to, to number the people, okay? Uh, tempted him to number or whatever. And then in Chronicles, it says Satan tempted him. And people will say, oh, look, that's a discrepancy. It's not a discrepancy. You see, God doesn't actually physically do the evil, right? He doesn't, allow, he doesn't do the harming of people or whatever, but he sends his angels, his ministers to do that. And why would we think that he wouldn't have ministers in hell? You say, oh, well, that wouldn't be fair. Look, they, they probably were created to, to do that. I mean, you, you could look at the same thing and say, well, it's not fair for, for cherubim to have to sit there and give praises to him all day long, 24 hours a day. No, that's what they love to do. That's what they're created to do, and they have a desire to do it. This is the same mentality people will say like, Man, I don't even want to go to heaven if all you do is sit around and sing songs and uh, and play your harp or whatever. Look, you're going to have a desire to do it, <laughs> okay? There's nothing else in the world that you're going to want to do but to praise the Lord. And I don't know what all we're going to do in heaven, but but don't let that be a, a deterrent. You know, Don't let that be a negative. You say, I don't think I want to go to hell. You're, I mean, I don't think I want to go to heaven. You're stupid. If you'd rather go to hell? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so I don't know what these creatures are, but I would suspect that they are, are, are maybe there even now, and they were created to be tormentors. That's what I'm thinking. Now look at, uh, let's see, how far did I read on that? Go back to uh, Revelation. Revelation 9. It talked about the shape of the locust, talked about the, they had teeth uh, of lions. Talked about the breastplate, uh, some kind of armor that they had on, whatever. Look at verse 11. And they had, uh, oh, by the way, their their job, though, at this point in time, was to come out and to torment people for five months to the point where all these people are going to want to die, but they can't die. And I don't know to what extent that happens, but you kind of wonder, like, are they trying to kill themselves and they're just and it won't work or, or what? But for five months, they have to endure this, this pain. And verse 11 says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. I mean, that right there called him an angel, all right? So you say, oh, yeah, but well, it's a fallen angel. Well, so fall, fallen angels just have this, you know, <laughs> just, you know, they, they could just be king. Now, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I believe the devil has an army. All right. I think the fallen angels are uh, doing Satan's work for me. I don't believe Satan can be everywhere at once. OK, and so he has demons that are doing that for him. I don't know to what degree that works, uh, how much power he has to be able to do that. But here's the thing. Satan's not in hell. All right, Satan roams around this earth seeking whom he may devour. Demons literally are possessing people on this earth right now. So it's not like he's just got this this army in hell that's scheming. You know, how can we uh, how can we torture people? No, they're going to be tortured. They're going to be tortured for all eternity. Amen. So it wouldn't make sense for them to be the ones doing the torture. Okay. All right. So uh, verse eleven then gives us a little bit of insight into the uh, the idea of the um, the uh, the angels there or the kings the king of the angel okay now number two we look at the second woe the second woe starts in verse 11 and it's this uh, strange destroying army okay don't know again exactly what we're talking about here but look at look at the uh, description of them verse 11. <clears throat> uh, actually, verse 12, sorry. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, uh, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were uh, prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, I, I, I don't know how to take this, okay? But these, these, again, angels that are prepared for this event. And these angels are bound up in the uh, river Euphrates. 
Now, interesting, I, I remember hearing somewhere, I couldn't find it. I looked, I, I tried to see where I, where I got this before, but I remember hearing somebody say before, like these could have been the angels that were guarding the Garden of Eden, all right, because they say it's in that area there at the Euphrates, and so maybe it's buried after the flood. It's been buried, and these angels are literally like under the water, and they're like still guarding that to this day. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just saying I've heard that explanation. And so these, uh, if this was the case, these four angels, but I think I don't think it said anything about four angels in Genesis. But anyway, are released at this point to be able to do this job. Now I, I don't know that that's the case. Some have also pointed to, look at uh, 2 Peter 2. Second Peter 2, in verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. And he goes on, of course, the context is here saying, hey, he knows how to punish the ungodly and to, uh, and, and to uh, save the uh, righteous. But here, what he's talking about, these angels, that when they sinned, they were cast down to hell. Okay, and they were in chains of darkness. Now, I said a minute ago, I said, now, wait a minute. The, the angels are the ones that are going to be in torment. Well, these angels have apparently been in torment <laughs> all this time. You know, I, there's a few different uh, interpretations there you could have about chained in darkness. You know, some say, well, that's not really the same thing, you know, as, as being suffering in hell. I don't know. But whoever these angels are, you know, if, and whatever they did, because these are obviously wicked angels, fallen angels, these were literally chained up and reserved unto judgment. Now, it's possible these are angels that are released. Jude talks about the same thing. Look at Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation... He hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. All right, so it's possible either that or they're waiting for their judgment, their final judgment, uh, you know, to be thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, whatever the case, I'm sure there's lots of interpretations. I, you know, like I said, the more I read this, the more I realize how little I know about about prophecy. But these are some interesting thoughts. Okay, uh, what I don't see in either of those verses, just FYI, what I don't see in any, any of those verses are they were thrown into jail because they came down and, and, uh, and had relationships with, with men of, with, daughter, with the daughters of men. I just, I don't see that anywhere, okay? But they left their habitation, maybe at the same time that Satan fell, you know, then they fell, but they were actually chained up whereas Satan ro roams the earth, okay? That's just the most I can get from, uh, from the scripture with my limited thing uh well actually look at look back at revelation before we go to the next passage look back at revelation i'll talk about this army i mentioned the four angels and they've got an army with them okay uh let's see here chapter 9 verse where were we 12 13 14 <clears throat> Uh, let's see, no, 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. Is that, what's that, 200 million? 200,000 thousand? That's a, whatever the case, that's a lot. That's a huge army, okay? And I heard the number, and then you're also thinking like the earth, okay, all the Christians are gone, right? All those who are left, like a third of them have already died, you know, from, from fire and, and such. And, and, uh, and man, how many people could there be left? But then now you got 200 million, you know, of, these, of these, uh, this army that cannot be killed, cannot be stopped. And they're coming. This is interesting. Okay, verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision of them that sat on them. Okay, so this is the, the, these armies, and they got the horses, and now these people sitting, uh, these these figures that are sitting on them. Look at this, having breastplates of fire 
fire and smoke and brimstone. See all the fire? Again, all the visions that we have of angels, even the cherubim and uh, uh, that Ezekiel saw and that John sees in the, in the beginning of Revelation always look very similar with this fire and, and it's hard to, to describe any other way. And this is what we see. And then it says, By these three was the third uh, part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by the plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, uh, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. There's no doubt about it. These people aren't crying out for, I mean, they're maybe begging for mercy, but they're not crying out saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> These people are hardened. Uh, their hearts are hardened. They hate God. Even in this time, they're probably scheming of a way that they can beat God. We know that that goes on during the millennium. And the, the, the devil, even after the millennium, tries to, tries to gather an army one last time. It doesn't last very long. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it's really strange. But there are people that are totally reprobate and will not turn to the Lord, but keep resisting Him and resisting Him and resisting Him. And so God puts them through uh, these torments. But look, you say, well, that just seems so rough that they're going to be in these torments and they're going to want to die and they can't die. Well, guess what? That's their fate for all eternity. All eternity. Look, sometimes if you if you recognize that, I, I have tried to reason with people that say that just doesn't sound like a good, just God. That He would punish somebody for all eternity with that kind of suffering. That just doesn't sound. I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses. I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses that say, "Would a loving God really do that?" And so here's what they say. They say, "I'm getting ahead of myself in the notes, but that's okay." <laughs> they say uh, that. When, I, I guess they must believe in hell, like right now there's a hell, they probably think it's not that bad. It's like Abraham's bosom or something. Okay. They believe there's a hell, and then they believe that when, uh, when death and hell cast into the lake of fire, they say annihil is, uh, uh, annihilation, right? Annihilationism or something like that is what they believe. They say they just cease to exist. They just disintegrate and they go up in smoke, never to exist again. Now, <laughs> I, I, I don't enjoy the thought of somebody necessarily being in torment for all eternity, but would it make any sense to, for them to just all of a sudden not exist anymore? Be, what would the, be the point of torturing them for X amount of time, and then boom, there's no memory, there's no existence, they just don't even have a thought anymore. They're, it's like they never existed. It would be like almost like a waste to punish them for all that time, right? No, God, look, this is why you don't mess around with God. <laughs> Because God can punish for all eternity where somebody could wish that they could die and they don't die. Right. They could seek death and not find it. Look, I, I don't know how, I mean, typically when we preach the gospel, we preach, hey, you don't want to go to hell, do you? No, I didn't think so. Let me tell you how you can avoid going to hell. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that approach. But you know what? I think sometimes people don't even completely understand, especially the people that are like, yeah, yeah, I don't really know if I'm going to heaven or not. And you're like, well, could I show you? Nah, I got to go eat. You know, I got to go. I got to go to work here in a little bit. You know, they don't understand right. what hell is really like. They don't understand that God is a consuming fire. They don't understand the wrath of God upon those who reject his son, Jesus Christ. Look, he gave a gift, right, of eternal life that we could be joint heirs with His Son, Jesus Christ, for all eternity, rule and reign with Him, a thousand years in the millennium. And I don't even know what awaits after that. <laughs> but, but it's going to be a good time, all right? And so He offered that gift completely free, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? Christ. He, and he, he gave that for free. And people will say, well, yeah, I just think I'll just take my chances. You know, I've been a pretty good person. Man, you are going to spend all eternity in the lake of fire. Uh, <clears throat> when somebody really realizes that, I remember as a little bit, maybe that's why younger people, are. it's easier for them to get saved because when they hear that, they don't have any problems understanding like, 
I don't want to go there, <laughs> you know. And so when they hear, like, you don't have to go there, put your trust in Jesus Christ, believe on Him as your Savior, accept that gift, and you can be saved. And they're like, well, why wouldn't I want to do that, right? But for some reason, people get older, they're just, I'm just not sure about that. And I think maybe there's reincarnation, or maybe there's, a, a, you know, annihilation or something like that. But surely no God would actually uh, punish someone for all eternity. Well, you, you can take your chances if you want. So that is the woe number two. <clears throat> woe number three is, uh, there's not a whole lot mentioned about that. We're going to talk about that actually next week, okay? But it's not exactly sure. In fact, it almost seems as though this is kind of hidden a little bit. And uh, later on, we'll be able to get more information, I think, when we look at the vile judgments, okay? Now, I talked about this in Iola. I don't think I've mentioned it too much here, but I think probably most people in here understand this concept, and I know we've talked about it before. But I believe that this last woe happens, even though some of the specifics aren't there, in, this, in chapter 11. Okay? At the end of chapter 11, that's it. That's the end of the book, All right, except that he tells the story again, basically. And we see a different perspective on that. Now, <clears throat> some people teach that there's no reason to, uh, to make that, that division there and that you can just keep on reading. And actually what they teach is that third woe is everything that happens after chapter 12, like the vile judgments and all that kind of stuff. I don't believe that. I think the last woe takes place in this last chapter, and then, and then you know, the millennial kingdom takes place. Okay, Now, new story. Or, or new account of the same story, chapter 12. Okay, so we'll get to that here pretty soon. <clears throat> but here are some things we know about torment in hell. Okay, even if, I, even if I got some of this wrong, I got my timeline a little wrong, I got some of the events, you know, maybe, the, maybe those locusts are airplanes, <laughs> you know, or helicopters or something like that. Who knows? Okay, I might have got some of these things wrong. But this idea of seeking death and not finding it, here's what we know. The tormenting doesn't stop after these three woes. Okay, that's just, that's just kind of like a taste of what they're going to get in hell. All right, And so it doesn't stop there. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. And that is eternity, okay? Uh, we know that the tormenting doesn't stop after the... The uh, unsaved die and are cast into the lake of fire. They continue to be tormented day and night. Okay, they have uh, already talked about annihilism. Uh, we, don't, we don't believe that. And, uh, and then we talked about how people say, well, it's not fair. It's not fair. Why would God, if he's, God's a good God, why would he do that? Well, here's a, uh, uh, here's a comforting verse in the Bible. Okay, in uh, 2 Peter it says this. God is not willing that any should perish. It's not his desire. It's not what he wants. That's not his intention. Contrary to the Calvinist doctrine that says he elected some people to go to hell. No, that's not his desire. Yeah. He is not willing that any should perish. Now, a lot are going to perish because they reject him. But he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, look, this is our job. This is why we're still here. Look, I would love to be in eternity. The minute I got saved, it would have been nice to be transported up into heaven and to live for all eternity. But that's just not the way it worked. God left us here and he said, hey, just endure to the end. Just keep on working. Keep doing the work. Suffer if you got to suffer. Like, well, hey, if God gives you uh, some things to enjoy in this life, enjoy them. Nothing wrong with that. But live uh, in uh, the spirit of poverty. You know, be poor in spirit. Uh, live understanding there's going to be persecution, understanding that there's going to be division. Sometimes people are going to make fun of you for being a Christian. They're not going to like you. They're going to mock you. They're going to even hate you sometimes. They're going to persecute you. Keep doing it. Why? Because you're carrying out the work of Jesus Christ and you're hoping to save some people from the fire okay, and from the eternal torment. So let's uh, be about the Father's business. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the work. Uh, what you called us to, and, and I pray, Lord, that you'll help us be motivated at the thought of eternal uh, damnation, eternal torment, and help us be motivated to do what we can to stop people from going there. And I thank you, Lord, uh, for our salvation. Thank you for Jesus, and 
in the gospel and and uh, paying our our uh, the paying the price of our salvation. Lord, we give you thanks for that, and we want to serve you, and we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, Amen.